What's up, Salt Strong Nation? Joe Simons, like diamonds, we are back talking about pier fishing, and we got a new face. Or if you're listening to the podcast, we got a new voice. Andy Benedict, welcome to the stage. What's up, dude? Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Happy to be here. Very excited. So just like Tony and just like Wyatt and just like Justin, just like all of our fishing coaches, Andy came from within. And what I mean within means the Insider Club. He has been a member for quite a few years. He's come to some events. He's posted just some fantastic fishing reports. And he actually spends a lot of time with his family in and around the Panhandle. Have a place there where he is right now. And uh, so we uh, we were talking and, you know, we've been looking for new fishing coaches. And by the way, if you're listening, you think you are a friend or a fishing guide or someone who's just really skilled. And uh, the Carolinas, we're looking for one there. You know, Wyatt now is in Texas. But uh, Andy said, hey, I want to own the Panhandle. I'm here all the time. I'm fishing like crazy. I love the stuff. I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, not the Dr. Juice, Justin. And, uh, you know, I, I want to come out here and and uh, improve myself. So uh, we've been working with him and uh, you'll see his face a whole lot more, especially covering the panhandle, a lot of beach fish and a lot of surf fishing and, and now pier fishing. So we're going to talk about the different types of pier fishing. There's in general, there's two types. You're going to have the type of pier fishing that is on the beach. That also includes, you know, passes and inlets that are right near a beach. And then also more of the inland ones and, and bays and even estuaries and, uh, and, and, and more inland piers normally those are going to be a little bit smaller and they're completely different in terms of the types of tackle even the types of people you're going to see there uh and, and kind of what to expect and the mistakes that you can make at both and we've made them we've made plenty and probably will make many many more so who wants to kick this off i guess let me introduce everyone else we already talked about Anne. we got wyatt we got luke we got justin uh we had courtney was on she had to bounce out she's going up and doing some surf fishing tactics herself on the beach right now why the wind finally decided to dine down for a day. Uh, but guys, who wants to kick this off? Pier, pier fishing, beach versus inland, what's the deal? Andy, I'm going to say let's do the biggest mistake. And I, Andy mentioned it before we started, and it's the biggest mistake. Most of us have done it. If anything, we've all heard of this happening. And it going to a pier, you see it all the time, and I cringe every time because it could cost somebody a good amount of money. So go, go, go for it, Andy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, you know, I've been to the pier many times and, and I've hooked up a few times and literally I, I was lunging for my pole because uh, you know, half the people out on a pier or, or a dock, but on a, on a pier have their pole leaning up against the, the railing or the piling and either they don't have their drag super loose um, uh, and that pole, the, the fish takes that, takes that bait. Uh, take, starts running and that pole starts flying down the pier or over the edge and then you, your, your rod and reel and everything's gone or it's badly damaged. So uh, my, my suggestion there is, is, uh, is take a ratchet strap and, a, and a, get your PVC, you know, sand spike, put it up against a, a piling or a post uh, that's there on, on the pier and strap that thing down and you, there you got a, a safe place to keep your, your rod. Why have you lost a, a rod before? So I didn't personally use it, but I took a young man fishing. He's probably 10 or 11 years old. And, you know, he didn't have the patience to fish artificial lures um, or the skill. Uh, so I set him up a little live bait shrimp rig and uh, had it sitting out there. And I'm guessing that either a really big stingray or a big drum came along and he just wasn't paying attention. And uh, he had it sitting there and he was just kind of looking at it all around and that rod went flying over the rail. It almost knocked him in the head when it somersaulted over. And uh, you could just see the rod and reel getting dragged in and around the pilings. And I'm just like, oh my God, mm. this is this is one of my inshore setups too. You know, it was just kind of an improvised trip to the pier. So all of the, uh, all the veterans on that pier, I just was so embarrassed and they were having to sit there and someone took that little gap hook uh, that's got the big rope on it and they managed to get the rod up. Unfortunately, the fish or the stingray had wrapped itself around the pilings and ended up breaking off. But, you know, it was, it happened so fast. Um, you know, it, whatever that fish was, it took off real quick and that rod doubled over the side just immediately. There was no way uh, that even if, even if the young man had been watching it, he wouldn't have been able to grab it in time. So I definitely don't leave those things sitting up against the side. Andy had a great point there. Uh, you know, try and ratchet them down or, you know, if you've got a cart uh, that you can bring out a pier cart, 
make sure that that's strapped down as well. And there's enough weight on that cart to secure that rod if something goes running off. Uh, a lot of times I just like keeping my rod in my hand and keeping a good grip on it. Uh, I often don't often fish live bait rigs or static rigs. Um, I am usually fishing artificial baits, uh, but if I am fishing those types of rigs, I still have a really good steady grip on my rod because you never know what's going to come across uh, and grab it, especially on some of those piers in Florida. I've seen some really big grouper uh, that have come come around, and I'm sure that those rods would be gone if those fishermen weren't paying attention to what was going on. <laughs> Justin, you fished on both types of piers. What's what's like a just a, a big difference, an obvious one? uh size i think it's the first one it, it, you know fishing inland piers uh or like big long public docks uh is size you, you know there's not going to be nearly as many people fishing like an inland or inshore pier as there would, would be a a big beach pier like in navarre or um i'm thinking there's a couple i remember i fished reddington back in the day luke long time ago before reddington's torn down now right um sure yeah yeah, I think Reddington's down now, uh, but there's a big pier at Clearwater. The piers that are beachside are much, much bigger, much longer, can accommodate more people, and in theory, would hold more fish, I, I think. Uh, but the biggest thing size, I think you're going to have less people if you fish a pier that's inland uh, around a creek or, uh, you know, our main river uh, than fishing beachside. But um, I think the biggest thing is how much tackle you take out there. Uh, you fish the beach side, you're going to take a lot of different things to go for different species. Take a cart and a bubbler and a live well and eight different rod and reels and a cast net and all kinds of stuff. And on a, on a, like a pier that's inside or mainland or, or inland, I guess, however you call it, um, probably would need to take as much tackle because there's only so much space and you're probably only going after two or three species max, um, so I think, uh, I think the number of people you're going to fish around is the first thing I think of. Uh, and then kind of what we'll hopefully segue into is talking about when to go pier fishing and what you're going to go fish for, depending on the time of the year. So first thing I think about is if I'm going to go to a pier, regardless whether it's inland or on the beach, um, is it May? Is it November? Like what's around in my area right now? Uh, and how do I want to gear up appropriately? Am I bringing spoons? Am I, you know, a diehard shrimp guy for the day? Which sometimes in the wintertime, like, it's all about the shrimp. Um, so just try to try to gear up depending on the season and what you're going to go for. All right. A little note to self by Justin Callender. He doesn't know if it's May or November. Okay. So which, determine if it's May. <laughs> which, which, which one, before we get into that, which one do you guys think is easier for a new angler who just wants to get tight lines, what, what's, what's less intimidating? Or I, I think you, you hit it. There's going to be more people. It might be a little bit more intimidating. There's also more people to help. And there are some very helpful people on, on most of these peers. But which one do you guys, which one would you recommend if a friend called you or emailed you and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going out there. I'm, I'm new. I'm a little nervous. Which, which, which type of peer should I go to first? I would say that a beach peer is Problem. There's just so many different species, and especially you know in the summertime this time of year, one of the easiest fish to catch off of a pier is a Spanish mackerel, and you just really got to throw something shiny. We're going to talk about tackle and retrieve and everything. It is super easy to go out in the summertime. I've taken so many newbies, people that have never even been saltwater fishing, uh, and just taken them out to go catch some Spanish mackerel off of piers, and they are literally everywhere from Texas all the way up to Virginia. I caught them in the Carolinas. I've caught them in Florida. Caught them here in Texas. They're everywhere. They're super easy to catch and they're a ton of fun. I would say if you're just a new angler trying to get tight lines on a pier, go to the beach and go target some Spanish mackerel. That's really, really easy for me. Yeah, there's there's less snags at the beach piers as well. So sometimes some inland piers, there's going to be oysters down there and rocks. And, and if you're bottom fishing, it's going to claim a lot of gear, especially if you're if you're kind of new and not used to rigging for, for weedless. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind too, is the, the amount of structure. Whereas the beach, there's hardly any structure there. It's usually just, just sand, and, but the pilings themselves actually make for great structure for, for, uh, for those who are going after the bottom dweller fish. Cool. I've got a little differing view on that. Um, I, I've, I've been out to many, you know, several piers, uh, beach and inland. You know, that, that environment on, on, a, on a beach pier can get pretty intense, can be intimidating, can be, you know, there's a lot of etiquette that some people 
might not be aware of. Um, you know, you, you, you have some people that get a little uh, possessive of, of certain spots of, you know, there's some rules that you should kind of be following and it can be a little intimidating. And so that's, that's part of the reason why I didn't take my kids for the first time to appear. Um, Cause I did experience that. Um, I, I did know the rules a little bit, but I was like, I'm not going to take my kids over here if I don't know exactly what I'm doing. Um, although I, I would hope that most people are helpful, but then there are those ones that, that, one don't like kids or, or they're like, get out of my space or, you know, it could be a, a negative experience. So it, it's a little less intimidating in my opinion to go to a, a, a pier inland. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's less crowded. Um, there's maybe the less serious angler there that might not be as intense. It's a little more relaxing. It's a little less, it's a little more forgiving, I'll say. So where did you go? What was, what was like the first experience with the kids? Yeah. Um, well, first experience with the kids was, was uh, probably, because my kids were really young, but this was about five years ago. And we went down to the Destin Pier. And um, there, there are a lot of serious guys down there. I mean, I'm sure there are serious men and women everywhere, but it, it was loaded down with some serious, it was a, you could, you could kind of cut it with a knife. You could feel the intensity that was pretty crowded. Um, people were, were, um, were vying a little bit for, for their space. And, um, and my kids were running up. They wanted to see this. They wanted to see that. And you could tell that some people were like, you know, you know that might be a little too close for my comfort. You know, watch out for my setup, watch out for my, where my pole is, that kind of thing. So, so we I quickly gathered them and said, look, you know, just hang near me. We're going to kind of take this in. Um, and so after we left, we then went to uh, a, a pier again in Destin that was on the bay side. And um, it was a totally different environment. There were people, but it wasn't, there was a lot more room for error, uh, you know. And so we felt, uh, we felt better there. And we caught, we caught a few fish. So. Cool. Uh, and I'm going to, at least tell you now because i don't want you to go broke but we have a rule that every time someone says pole unless you're teaching someone you have to pay a dollar into the into the jar so i think you're like seven right now okay you owe okay. seven dollars to the podcast fund <laughs> only rod we had a vote we did have a vote because we had we had quite a few guests that were saying both and we finally came to a vote like all right we have to make, draw a line in the sand and it's just rod got it and that goes for anyone leaving comments in this blog post you better not say pole Oh, I owe a buck. <laughs> All right. So let's go back to the calendar. Who wants to cover that? The, the when? Um, and, and this is, I assume this is like, know thy species, right? Know what you're targeting. Is that what we're saying here? 100%. We do season, so season by season. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm good to go with the beach side of things first. I, I've spent a lot of time targeting, you know, those semi-pelagics that run kind of near shore close to the beach. And I would say that, you know, pier fishing really kicks off uh, at the, the midpoint of spring. I wouldn't say I've really had a lot of success early spring, mid spring to late spring, early summer is when things really start rolling. Uh, and you're going to get those uh, kingfish and Spanish mackerel that are really going to start kicking things off. Um, those are typically the first species I see that are going to get caught at the piers. If you're a little bit further north, uh, what I mean is like the Carolinas, mid-Atlantic areas, you might have bluefish that roll in first and those can actually be a lot of fun. People, uh, you know, tend to frown on bluefish, but you know, for someone that's just trying to get tight lines, they are a lot of fun. Uh, if you've got, you know, the right leader for them, because they're very toothy, they're a lot like Spanish mackerel, they'll cut you off, um, but they fight really well. Um, and I know a lot of people make sandwiches out of them. So they, they, uh, they can be a fun fish to catch and eat, um, but you'll typically see those in Spanish mackerel uh, and kingfish showing up first. Now, depending on where else you live, you know, if you're a little bit further south, um, there are some other species that will start coming onto uh, the piers. Uh, you, you can get some, say, I've seen sailfish caught off of piers. I have seen, you know, some, some fish that you would typically see caught a lot further out, um, some tuna, albacore, things like that, that come really close to the beach. Uh, and you can actually get them off the piers. That's not a very common catch, um, but you will see things like that happening. I would say uh, you also get shots at Pompano and other, you know, they're kind of 
the species that aren't large predatory fish, but they're just migrating up and down the coast. So you get whiting, you get pompano, uh, things like that that's, that run in after as well. Uh, you usually have an outflow of shrimp uh, that is, is coming out of the marshes, coming out of the kind of inland areas um, from where they were holding in the wintertime. They flush out towards the Gulf and the Atlantic and those whiting, those pompano, they all you know run the beaches and they tear those guys up. Uh, the thing that triggers those larger predatory fish is the inflow of bait. You know, there's a ton of different bait migrations. I call it snot bait. You guys have seen me reference that when I talk about this right here, which is like one of my favorite uh, baits or lures for pier fishing. It's just a small spoon, uh, but this is the size of the bait that you're going to see in spring and summer that most of these predators are keyed in on. I've seen kingfish that are like, you know, they're, they're 40 inch kingfish that are caught on these little spoons like that. Uh, and, and, you know, that's just what fish are keyed in on. So everything is kind of triggered by the migrations of bait as you get further in through the summertime, uh, that's going to kind of start to die off. And then, you know, you get this outflow of mullet that occurs in the fall. Those really big bait fish imitations, again, you're going to have really big kingfish that start running. The kingfish bite dies off midsummer, but it picks back up in the fall. Again, you start getting, you know, some of those larger pelagics that move in close, you know, to get into some of those mullet. You can get a lot of tarpon in the fall, um, you know, regardless of where you live. I know a lot were caught in the Carolinas in the fall where I lived in Wrightsville Beach. Uh, you know, it, it's something that does occur and it can happen. Um, further here in Texas, you know, uh, we can get that as well, but that apparently that's a little bit more of a late summer thing, not fall. So it, it regionally occurs differently. Uh, you just kind of got to stay in tune with what's going on. One of the best things you can do is just call your local peer because you got to think there's not a lot, they, they, they don't want to hold in information because if they tell you, you know, the bite is hot at our peer, here's what's being caught. You come buy a ticket to go onto that peer. You know, it's not like a lot of secret information that's held in when you're fishing bays or flats, things like that people don't want to know your secret spot the pier is not a secret spot so they want to tell you everything they can to get you to come to the pier um, but definitely try and reference what's going on in addition to what the pier uh you know owners are telling you but usually they can give you the best info on you know what's running what's biting i mean you can kind of keep in tune even on days that i wasn't going out to the pier i was calling them to see you know what's biting so i can find out you know what's in tune you know if i knew that those mackerel were running i knew that the pompano weren't going to be far behind in that springtime frame uh, and i can kind of get onto that bite as well so it, it's just usually the spring and the fall are the best time frames but you can get on a very consistent bite throughout the summer as well for mackerel and pompano. do you did you ask them to like hey bob is anybody in my spot down there far <laughs> left <laughs> see you know what I, i'll tell you at the end of the pier there are people that get very possessive over their 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 area and that's typically when you get to the end of the pier that's when people are fishing for those semi-pelagics those those large kings you know sometimes the tuna the sailfish the tarpon a lot of those bigger predatory fish you're going to catch them off the end of the pier just because you're a little bit further out so there are regulars that are there every single day and if you want to try to get into some of that fishing you got to beat them there so you got to be there early you got to be the first in line to buy your ticket uh, and then you can get out there but know that they don't own the pier they may be a regular but you have just as much of a right to that spot as they do so just make sure that you're prepared to get out there and set up because you know if they beat you there they beat you there but if you beat them there you beat them there so that's something to keep in mind as well there's no spots on piers and i, I want to make that very clear because i have seen people get you know irked about that or get worried that you know i can't show up because that's the x y and z spot it's just not the case no, even though of course he probably has a shank and he's going to try to kill you you should be fine <laughs> <laughs> bring your gap hook as well you'll be all right hey what so what in the world do you do when you hook a tar are you just hoping it's going to spit the hook and jump like most tarpon do i can't imagine catching a tarpon on the end of a pier Oh, I want to so, do that one though, because like that's all, that's all I'm about, man. Is I'm all about like the biggest possible thing you can get from land, other than sharks. I'm not much of a shark guy. What do you do with it? I'm just envisioning being up on a 20 foot high pier. Like, what do you? You're not going to gaff I mean, the tarpon. I mean, you're definitely not bringing it up. Every state has their own regulations. In Florida, you can't remove a tarpon over 40 inches out of the water. I think in Texas and other places, you you do have the ability to get a permit and harvest one per season or per trip. I oh, they're delicious, they're delicious fish. Oh, yeah, tarpon steaks are like a delicacy. No, <laughs> like I I was desperate for years and years throughout Florida to go for a big, like a tarpon from land. That was like one of my immediate bucket lists. And uh, and it's pure sport. I mean, it's, it's technical why it kind of touched on the whole like guys going for kingfish and bonito and potentially tuna and sailfish. Like some parts of Southeast Florida, guys are doing that. 
in the panhandle. There's guys that can get a black fin from Navarre Pier. It happens. Um, and, and, and it's a common thing sometimes in the summer when you time it right. Um, so like there's some crazy fish you can get from piers, but I think it's like for tarpon, it's truly bragging rights. Um, not an easy thing to do. You gotta have a ton of line. You have no control. Like you are landlocked. That fish pulls line. All you have is your rod, your line. Uh, I said rod. I was like, oh gosh, should I say pull? Oh, I said pull. Oh no, no. <laughs> nice. That's two. That's two. Oh, We're right. up to 10 bucks now. This is a, this is an expensive podcast episode. <laughs> You got to be, yeah, you got to be geared up for it. It's doable. If anybody wanted to go out and go for tarpon from land on a pier, doable in certain parts and at certain times of the year. And why it said later, later in the summertime, as they start migrating up, for sure, it is possible. You can gear up and do it. And it's, it's wild. So, yeah, very cool. It, it definitely is. And Joe, to answer your question, how they land them, you either get off the pier. So you're, you're working in a team with somebody, you hand your rod down to someone, you have to walk back. Uh, or what I was, what I saw done at North Carolina piers, I'm sure it is highly illegal in Florida, giant drop nets. You put, you basically put them down in the water, you get the fish into the net and you've got six guys that are holding onto a rope that's this thick and they pull it up. Uh, and, and, you know, you take a picture, you lower the fish back into the water. I saw sharks landed like that on those piers and you know you know the grip and grin right on the pier and then they put it right back in the water and it swims off so i don't think it's the most ethical way to handle the fish um i would not want to hook a tarpon from a pier just because i'd be worried about the ethics of making sure it was able to swim off uh, but you know that's how i've seen it done I, i've seen that done with a lot of different species as well those drop nets are a very common thing to use when you get larger fish involved very interesting all right who's next what what uh what season are we going to hit and do we want to go inland or I was stick with beach? We covered probably everything in terms of there's not a whole lot that goes on in the wintertime, at least at the piers that I fish, you know, in the Carolinas, really all you could go after in the wintertime was dogfish. Sometimes you had shots at redfish, um, but that was kind of, it, it was an on and off thing. You had to be a regular that was going, you know, every single day. And then you'd maybe have one day. It was so varied that it really was not worth, you know, the time and effort, at least for me. Uh, to, to go out and be there and just hope one day I got lucky to come across some of those fish that were running the beach. Uh, but I would say, you know, I typically don't go to the piers in the wintertime. I, I'm there, you know, spring, summer, and fall. Those are my, those are my pier months. So I, I'd say we'd probably be good to start covering kind of the seasonal aspects of inland piers now. Cool. Who wants to start? Well, the, the fall time for me, uh, inland piers, that's, that's where I go the most. Uh, inland piers are there's several close by where we live, and um, the fall fall time is just excellent. I mean, it's excellent in general, you know, surf fishing, but it, um, it, it, at our inland piers, um, I mean, it's go, go to shrimp. Uh, make sure you got a nice heavy leader. Um, we we've caught a lot of black drum, uh, redfish. And uh, those things just just seem to pile up underneath those docks and in, in that that pier, and you throw in a little you throw a, a nice lively shrimp, um, and and it's a quick meal and a, and a, and a great a great uh, adventure and and fight. Just hold on. What what kind of leader you said heavy? What is what does that mean in in that sense? Yeah. To me, a heavy leader is 40, 40 to fifty pounds. Uh, I mean, there's not a whole lot that can really, if that, if that fish runs up against those barnacles and uh, on the pylons and the, 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 you know, underneath the, the, the pier, there's not much you can do, but, but it's going to be a lot better than a, than a, than a 20 pound. So 40 to 40 to 50 pounds. Cool. Luke, I know uh, you've done a little bit. We've even done some of the little, uh, what did we do that? We did that one, uh, kid what do we even call that course that was the big course kids, for kids but big kids fishing course hey kids fishing and we we went to just some inland piers and caught a bunch of like sheep's head and snapper it was fun uh, a little small i don't know what size hook let's let's try to break it all down for what someone needs yeah bears i think for somebody who just wants to go out and catch fish whether it's inland or beach the same thing applies is is use i mean fish use structure to feed most fish do we have the roamers like mackerel and stuff those are those are the roamers but the bottom dwellers are the ones that are probably the easiest to target um, because all you really need is just some shrimp it could even be frozen shrimp you could even get it like at the grocery store shrimp 
just need some sort of shrimp, soak it on the bottom um, and, and right next to the structure as close as possible. And that's why I highly recommend the weedless shrimp rig. And we featured it in, uh, in multiple videos. It's basically a way to, to rig the shrimp weedless so that you can just bounce it right up along the pilings and over rocks um, and right where most of the feeding happens and get striped. It, it might not be trophies. You're not going to catch sailfish doing this, but, uh, but you're going to catch a bunch of sheep's head. You're going to catch snapper, flounder, um, some catfish, obviously, that's going to be a bycatch, uh, but it, it'll just catch whatever's down there, really. And, and so it's really throughout all seasons, whether you're on the beach or inland, inland's probably a little better because there's going to be more structure down there. Um, it'll just catch fish. And, uh, and so as far as the hook size, just you, uh, try to make it this, the smaller the hook size, the more fish you're going to catch, right? Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to have the smaller fish now being hooked, whereas before they'd be stealing your bait. So you can go all the way down to like a size 10 if you want. That's just going to be a little small hook. You'll be catching every single pinfish down there if you want. Plus, you can actually catch some decent sized uh, trout on there as well. And then if you want to just, you know, isolate, you know, not catch the pinfish and get a little bit bigger fish, then go to like a size six hook plus or minus, and, uh, and just use little chunks of shrimp. And then if you want to go out and get bigger sheep's head, you want to get snook, redfish, sheep trout, then you go up to like a, a let's say it's like size two to one odd, depending on the size of the shrimp. So it's just smart to have a little bit of everything. Um, and like those little bullet weights are hard to beat. Uh, there's the bullet weights, I wish I had one here next to me, but it's a, it's a, it looks like a bullet and the, the pointy end basically ensures that you won't get snagged. And then when you read, rig that shrimp weedless behind it, you can literally bounce off every piling on that on that on that pier and not get snagged and then when you know there, there's going to be at least one of those pilings where there's a fish on it and uh and you'll just be able to catch catch them uh, some good fish so that's probably the, the easiest way to go out and consistently catch a fish from a pier cool one one great thing that, that we've done that is so exciting speaking of kids so exciting is take a take a very you know light rod and um, and and throw on a little sabiki rig, and drop that thing down there. And I mean, there's so much bait around piers, and you know, it's so exciting for a kid to pull up. And, and for me, I mean, I, I I'm like, and wow, that's I just hit the jackpot for bait. So you know, so many pinfish and and uh, small bait fish. You know, it's so exciting to be able to pull up your line with with um, pull well. Nope. We lose right. you. Are there? Okay. Technical yeah. for a moment. Am I back? Okay. Uh, pull up a line full of uh, little bait fish. So, so exciting. Yeah. And, and as far as just maximizing the catch, I think a, a big mistake I see people do is that, you know, for that bottom rig that I was referring to, is they're casting as far as they can, right? And uh, in many cases, there's not going to be a lot of structure out far away. And it's, it's really a, st a structure is, is the key. And so in many cases, it's best to drop straight down. As long as it's like four or five feet if, or even deeper, the better, really. But if it's if there's a decent amount of depth there, there's going to be a lot of fish right down below you. And so literally all you have to do, like you can get it brought to a kid. All they have to do is open up the bale, lure goes straight down right in the strike zone. So mm -hmm. I would say that that's a mistake. It, obviously, if you're going after the Spanish mackerel, right, if you're throwing spoons, that's when you're launching it. You know, those, those fish are roaming. So I, th I would say it's smart to isolate your target, whether you're going after the bottom dwellers, which in which case you're fishing on the bottom of your structure, or if you're going after the roamers, like, like mackerel, um, tarpon, you know, um, all that stuff. Two totally different applications. Let's talk about tackle. We've touched on a little bit, but also what you're bringing is different, right? I mean, if you are catching a tuna off the end of a pier, you're going to need a ton of line versus what you're talking about, Luke. I mean, you could do that with a normal, you know, 2,500, you know, the stuff that we always talk about, just, a, you know, die with fuego and a, and a TFO rod. So um, who wants to start with this in terms of, you know, what kind of tackle you're bringing, bring the big guns out and then how much, right? You see some of these guys come with their beach cart down the, down the pier and they've got six rods you bring two? I mean, I think one's too few in case something breaks, but how many you bring in and, and what? Mm. Well, first thing I want to talk about for, for peer setups is uh, I think everyone here will agree that regardless of whether you're fishing inland or off of a beach, do not use those pre-made steel rigs. <laughs> Tie your own rigs. 
learn and, and look through our videos on how to do a dropper rig for Pompano, how to soak a bait on bottom with shrimp, you know, simplicity specialist. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Exactly. Um, definitely the, the ready to go rigs that you can get at your local shop, the steel rigs. I don't see what benefit they offer. I know they're convenient. I think that that's the thing is that for people that are just getting into it and want to go out and do it and they ask, how do I do it? Convenience is there. But if you take just one little step extra and tie really simple knots and simple rigs, uh, one, you're, you're going to have the security of knowing that you tied it right and that you did it yourself. And that quality assurance is like priceless. And two, you're probably going to catch more fish when you, when you rig appropriately. Um, so first, like, I guess mistake is the first thing I think of is people that go out and just do like a Christmas tree rig of like steel. And, and I see that and I'm like, oh man, I know they'll probably maybe catch a whiting or a pinfish or a small sheephead or something. But if, if they went out there with the same setup with mono and dropper rigs done right, like chances are way, way better. Um, so Luke, you talked about rigging appropriately. We talked about, uh, what do we need to take out there? What is kind of the baseline of how many setups you take out. Uh, if I don't have a cart and which it, cart's expensive, they're like 150 bucks plus to have a beach cart worthwhile investment. If you're a diehard land-based fisherman, piers, jetties, whatnot, but for the most part two, for sure. Um, one for each, you know, different type of uh, one with a lure and one focused on using bait or, you know, cut bait, live bait is kind of my approach. If I had a cart, I think after four is too many. And I think at that point, it just determines like how many are you going to have set up on the rail? If you're going to be a, a bait fisherman and you're going to have two or three bait setups out, how many are you going to have out at one time? Cause you're, you know, you're one person or maybe with your buddy, you can't take up the whole pier. Like you're just going to have a section to fish. Um, I think four is enough. I think you're actively fishing one, maybe one's setting out, waiting for a big bite, like a big pinfish or something's out there for waiting for a big redfish or something. Um, and then you've got one or two backup uh, in case you break off and you just want a quick rig ready to go. If you have that option, I think four is enough to manage for one or two people. There's people I see that go out there with like 10 setups. And part of me is like, I, they got to be fishing all day or they just got to have this one special rod and reel for this one rare occasion that might happen one day out of the year. And some people will over prepare in that sense, but don't think that just because somebody has more rods and reels that they're more prepared or they're better armed for the scenario than you might be. It's, it's plan accordingly. Um, you can catch six, seven different species on one or two setups. If you want to keep it really, really simple, um, just have, you know, different hooks, different weight sizes, different lures for different species. So um, let's, let's go specific uh, on the beach side versus the inland. If you could bring two rods, let's just say, what, and, and reels, what are you doing? Uh, I'm always going to bring a go-to flat setup for either inland or, 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 or beach side, like a seven foot six spinning rod, 3000 size reel, anything like a 4,000 and less. Um, 10 pound braid and 20, 30 pound leader. And that's going to be kind of my combination rod of like, either I will decide to throw lures if I'm going for Spanish mackerel or maybe trout, um, or I'm going to, that's going to be my bait catching rod. It's going to be, I'm going to be using a sabiki or a tiny shrimp and, and a sinker. And that setup's just going to be for like kind of my utility setup. My other rod and reel is going to be my, my bigger game focus. It's going to be like a an eight to nine foot rod, some could be bigger. It's gonna be a much heavier action, a medium heavy to a heavy. Uh, and I'm gonna have like a, between a 5,000 and an 8,000 size reel. Um, spinning is my go-to, but sometimes I'll take a conventional out there and that's gonna be going for, for bigger game. Um, I just, I don't know, I don't mess around. Like if I go to, if I go to a pier, I wanna know the, that I can go for whatever the biggest option is that's, that's accessible to me. Um, but even if, even if it's a winter time or if there's only pompano around, small three, four pound pompano or, um, or some smaller black drum, I'll still take the same setup out there, but I'll downsize my leader. You know, I'll go to maybe a 30 or a 40 pound leader um, instead of, you know, Andy, you said 40 is heavy for you. Dude, I've hit the piers with like 120 pound leader before. Like it's no joke. <laughs> certain, certain areas, I, I got some, some serious ammunition, but yeah. Um, same rod and reel setup, still like a small utility. And then like another bigger one that I'll use pretty much for bait fishing. 
Um, and then I just use my leaders and my rigs depending on what I'm going to fish for. Yep. I remember the first time we went fishing with black tip H back in the day, back before the rest of you guys, it was just Luke and I, and, and probably Nick at that point. Yeah. Remember that Luke? And, and we were talking on the phone with them and we were inshore guys. Right. And prior to that, we were bass guys. Like we, we we hadn't even thought about the stuff that came out of his mouth and he's like yeah you guys need at least 500 yards of braid and we're like 500 yards what are we doing and we were it was during the mullet run he's like we're going after like monster sharks and monster tarpon on the beach and piers and uh that was like eye-opening i was like holy smokes uh but that that dude catches a lot of big fish because he's prepared he's got the got the big guns uh, that's cool. Any anyone have anything to, to add to that in terms of the 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 beach side? What you got, Wyatt? Yeah, I would say that you know we talked about uh, you know light setups for for mackerel. Um, I would say you know probably the two easiest things you could bring out, and this is probably my number one pure fishing lure. Period. Uh, the gotcha plug. You will catch everything with this: redfish, Spanish mackerel, trout, flounder. I mean, it, you can cover all different water columns with it, and you can fish it a ton of different ways lot of versatility to it and the biggest thing with pretty much every single one of the lures i'm going to talk about for pier fishing you need to be able to cast it really far you're fishing from a fixed position you can't move around a lot so you need to be able to cover as much water as possible at a minimum usually the lures that i'm throwing are an ounce so gotcha plugs an ounce these little spoon jigs are an ounce um you know and i try to match you know Basically, I, I like using white just because that's generally what the bait fish color is when you're on the beach. Um, we, we talked about this in a prior tea time, I think me and Justin, you know, fishing over sand, most of those bait fish typically are going to take on the color of that sand. They adapt to that environment. So they're usually white. Um, and, and I really keep my colors simple, um, but anything flashy really works well. If you want to use gold spoons, those work. Silver spoons, those work really well. But if you're specifically targeting, you know, larger game fish, you know, your mackerel, uh, king mackerel uh, specifically, maybe some larger redfish, you really cannot go wrong with some of these really big casting spoons. These are like, I want to say this one's like three ounces, but you can bomb these things out. Uh, you can get them, you know, and that's really the biggest key is, is these fish, the reason you're fishing off the end of the pier for the really large predators is because they're much further out um, and they're hunting, you know, those bait schools that are on the edges. So you really need to be able to cast really far out and these casting spoons get it done. I like the ones that have the foil on them. Just any kind of extra flash is really good. One uh, key I want to give you guys is, is make sure if you're ordering these ones that are off of Amazon that come in these boxes of like 30, uh, you take these little protectors off because uh, I fished for about an hour with one of these uh, and I was getting a lot of really big hits. And I'm pretty sure they're a pretty big redfish, but the problem is when you have these protectors on, you can't hook oh. anything. So <laughs> make sure you take those protectors off before you start fishing. Um, I lost out on a lot of really nice fish, but I've also hooked into some really nice big jacks with these um, off the beach uh, and, and, you know, off the jetties here in Texas, uh, you know, you'll get big jacks that run the beach. I've seen a lot of really big snook caught on spoons like this. Big bucktails will work for those snook as well. Uh, bucktails are another really great lure for, uh, again, you can cast them really far, uh, but if you if you want to get onto some flounder, you know, late fall, uh, as they're leaving the inlets and you're fishing those piers that are in close relation to those outflow areas, this is like one of the best lures you can have because you can bounce along that bottom, you can probe. We've all seen John Skinner's videos of him absolutely tearing up fluke. Um, and, and they're, you know, that's a subspecies of flounder. So they all behave similarly. This is a killer lure to use uh, for those fish because you can probe the bottom, you know, and you can just feel out different areas, different angles, and you can really find out where those pockets of fish are. Because flounder all hang out together. Usually it's around some form of structure. And uh, these bucktails are a great way to do that. So those are the, really all the lures I use. That's four different types of lures. Um, I would say the spoon and the gotcha plug. Uh, the jig spoon and the gotcha plug are about the same. So casting spoon, bucktail, um, and, uh, you know, just some side, some sort of small bait fish imitation, like the, the jig spoon or the, the gotcha. So not a whole lot of different types of lures. I like to keep it really simple. And again, I mainly fish artificials, but I can take all those lures uh, to the pier in a single tray of tackle, bring two setups, one big rod, one small rod, like Justin suggested. And uh, I can get on to pretty much everything at that pier. And what's interesting, if you go to piers where you are, Texas, uh, Wyatt in Texas, to Florida, to the Carolinas and everyone in between, you're going to see people 
that are either fishing with or have right there in their tackle box spoons, right? I mean, it's just so common in all those places and bucktails, some type of little jig with some hair on it. Um, flare hawks. I mean, you're going to have something like that. It, it's like, it just works everywhere. And, uh, and then obviously shrimp is the same. Uh, you're going to see people who are just fishing right there. Cause we, we saw it too. Every time we go to Sebastian, right? Luke, you got the guys that are fishing the structure. You got our boy, Joey up there, just launching, you know, two ounce, whatever, uh, bucktails and, and, uh, and spoons. And then you have the other guys who are just dropping it straight down and just trying to get all the black drum and sheep's head and stuff that are, that are right there in the, in the pilings. Um, it, 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 and you can't learn a lot. I, I feel, I feel like one of the best things to do, if you are, Andy, you mentioned it, you know, especially if you go during the summer and especially if you go during a weekend or like a holiday weekend, it is just, it can be crazy packed. And you'll always find people who are just helpful, who, who truly do want to help you. And if you just ask them, if you don't ask them a question, you're probably not going to get much help. They're just going to look at you and, 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 and might even crack a smile on you. But if you just ask, uh, I mean, we're the same way. We love when people, Hey, like, what should I do here? What not should I tie? What do you, what do you think about this? And they're going to say, no, 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 you don't want to use that. Like you check out this. You want to use this. You can learn so much just from, uh, from asking. And there might be a jerk here and there, uh, but for the most part, everyone's fairly nice especially if you just admit hey i don't know and i'm just trying to get better and i want to i just want to catch some fish and, and one thing to keep in mind too if you are using lures like I, i'll just talk about some of the inshore piers i've been going down to like placida pier it's a, it's a nice pier over in placida florida um has a little bit of everything right? it has good current flow like like most of piers it's kind of like um kind of next to a bridge so it has that current going through and a lot of structure uh, seagrass down there, rocks along the shoreline. So you can get a little bit of everything. But uh, one thing that's actually effective is lures and just, just fishing it just like I'm fishing from a boat or kayak. In most cases, you can do the same applications uh, that work from boat or kayak or even wading on a pier. So I'll take the same tree with a quarter ounce jig head and uh, which, you know, a jig and just cast, you know, diagonal on the upcurrent side and just let it kind of flow through and take it close to the pilings as close as I can without getting snagged. And you can catch an absolute ton of fish because the fish are laid up there and it's just a matter of getting a, getting a lure to them. Um, tough part is getting them out. So that's when you're going to need to bring the appropriate equipment. Um, when you're on the pier, it's not like in a boat where now where you're working the fish away from the structure. And, and uh, here you're working the fish to the structure where they're going to have a good chance of breaking you off. So I, I'm rarely using the 10 pound braid if I'm going after the, the bigger fish. I'll, I'll use it on the, from the boat. Um, but when I'm actually on the structure, it's like at least 20 or 30, sometimes more. Um, so just make sure to be, be prepared for whatever you're going after. Um, that way, you know, if, if you do catch the fish you're going after, you're, just, you're not going to lose it. You're not going to let that fish swim off with a, a hook or lure in its mouth. Um, but if I'm just going after like the snapper and sheep's head stuff, then like that 10 pound line and 20, just 20 pound, 30 pound mono is, is all you need to catch all the, the smaller bottom dwellers. But when you hit when you hook one of those big old snook off a pier, it is really hard. Like, it is almost impossible to land one on ten pound line. You have to, you have to beef up that tackle and uh, be ready for them. I'm glad you brought that up, Luke, about the swim bait, the the slam shady on a on a one fourth ounce jig. Um, when I go when I go to the pier, I have to, I have to really consider th you know two things. One, I, I really want to catch fish. And, and, and my kids, my two boys always want to go with me, which I love, but, but they also, if things aren't happening, they, they, they get a little bored, you know, they were a little, a little locked on, on the pier. So I always take the swim bait and what we've done when I've done with them, when they get a little restless and they love to do this is they, they just drop that, that swim bait down and let out about you know, 40, 30, 40 yards of line, and they just walk down and bounce it off the bottom. They just walk down the pier and they turn around and they walk back. And it, it's, uh, it's, it's something for them to be doing. And, and if we're not catching fish, uh, and they have caught fish several times using that technique and it, it keeps them, keeps them busy, keeps them uh, engaged, you know, so. It's like trolling. It's like yeah. trolling with your feet. Exactly. With mar marching orders for the kids. Marching orders, <laughs> boys. Step one, two. <laughs> Redfish on three. Here we go. Who brought up a a, a good point? And he's talking about casting a current diagonal on the pier. And, and a big question. And I wanted to bring this up. Um, uh, the topic just hadn't naturally occurred, but 
Luke gave me a nice little segue here. Big question I always hear from folks is which side of the pier should I fish? Um, and, and we talked about seasonality earlier. The, the big key to this is, you know, thinking about where these fish are migrating from and, you know, what time of year it is. So to, to make this really simple, and we've made videos on this, in the springtime, fish generally are looking for cooler water. So they're moving from the warmer waters they migrated to in the winter, moving north to the cooler waters. So in the springtime, what I like to do is target the south facing sides of the pier. As those fish are moving up that sh south shoreline towards the north shoreline, you've got a better chance of presenting your lure to them because as they're moving up, you know, you're casting. Again, I'm just thinking of Spanish mackerel, how they run the beach, you know, from south to north. Uh, they're moving in pods. So you've got a better chance of pulling that lure in front of their face uh, for an extended period of time versus if you're fishing the wrong side of the pier, those fish are moving from south to north. You're zipping your lure right by them. They have a very short window to strike instead of fishing it almost alongside them in front of their face. Uh, so that, that's your really best bet is think about where they're moving at different times of the year. And obviously this is inverse in the fall. You're going to want to fish the north facing side of the pier because those fish are traveling south towards the warmer water. Uh, we do have a video on this that I know I'm just saying directions on, and you're just having to listen to my voice, but if you want to see a graphic of which way is which uh, and how to fish that, uh, we do have a video on uh, which, side of the pier you, which side of the pier that you should be fishing, but I wanted to bring it up because this is a pier fishing podcast, and I'd say that's like the number one question that I hear from folks, but just take into account where those fish are migrating to, again, time of the year, what water they're looking for. Remember, South has warm water, north has cool water, and those fish are moving in those directions, um, you know, at different times of the year for those different reasons. Cool. And another question is, you know, hey, what's the best pier? Where do I go? Uh, a lot of it depends on the time of year, as we talked about, and, and really just what your, your goal is. Uh, I know Florida, uh, Tony did a video on this recently about the pier locator. Pretty cool. And uh, it's not just beach piers there and they're going to keep adding to this, but there's, there's a lot of stuff on there. It's really actually awesome. And I'm hoping all states do something uh, similar uh, is, is why it mentioned it's, they have a vested interest. Like, you know, they, they, most of these things are, are not privately owned. Uh, they, they want the, the revenue from that. It helps get more people out. It helps. It's just basically just raising taxes to make the piers nicer and, uh, and get people outside. So uh, that's a really cool thing to do. Uh, in terms of going on that, uh, just check that out. We'll make sure to put a link in the show notes of the video that Tony did. Uh, do you guys have any other tips or tactics on the best types of ones to go to during certain times? Or is there certain peers that you guys like to hit up? And, uh, and I'd love to hear if, you know, it, let's just say summertime right now, since we're in it and the dead of summer here, do you want inland or do you want beach? I, I want inland. In, inland. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I'm beach, man. Um, Navarre is fun for kingfish. Panhandle piers are fun for kingfish. Some people sight fish them, flipping a cigar minnow off the tip of the pier. Um, otherwise, uh, I enjoy Sebastian and Juno for big snook, the southeast part of Florida. Some of my favorite piers. Yeah, you mentioned Navarre. That was my first experience of seeing, you know, all these big, big game fish that were being, there was a sailfish caught, there was a, a big um, bonito that was caught, tons of kings. And it, this was just in one evening when I was a kid. And I just remember standing there watching all these guys catching these, because, you know, I just talked about where fish are migrating. If you think about the panhandle, uh, there's really no north south, it's just kind of sideways. So you've got fish coming from both directions. That is just like, one of the best piers. If you're looking for big game hunting, Navarre Pier is like money. Um, the, you know, all those piers in the Panhandle are fantastic, which is why I'm so excited to see all the content uh, that Andy's going to be having for us. He, he's in a fantastic location for this exact uh, type, type, type of topic. Um, but, you know, I would say in the summertime, you know, I'm not looking for piers that are, you know, close to the passes and inlets uh, because most of the fish that we're migrating in and, you know, you, you catch some action from those sides. Uh, there's not a whole lot of action there. I find if, if there is really a serious amount of, uh, of bait fish, um, you know, it's on those piers that are isolated on long stretches because, you know, you think about there's one piece of really big structure on that big shoreline. Most of those fish and most of that bait's going to gravitate there. Um, you know, if you're fishing near a, a pier that's on a, in close relation to a pass or an inlet, 
most of that bait's going to, you know, get flushed into the inlet, get flushed into the pass. And there's just not going to be as much activity as you would find on those isolated piers. So if I had to choose, you know, and I love fishing the beach pier. So I have to, I have to say the beach piers are going to be my choice. I, I would look for ones on those isolated stretches of the shoreline. Is it also have anything to do with the fact you got pants on that one inland pier that one time with the young kids down there? You know, look your pants down. Look, look, listen. This is a sensitive topic. Look at this guy. I don't even know what happened. Yeah, and White made a classic mistake. You don't pull the pants back up. If you get pants on a pier anywhere, inland or beach, you keep them down, and you let them know this doesn't bother me, and you fish the whole day with the pants down. Press your dominance by staring (laughs) down. This is my corner. So did it have anything to do with that or no? Oh, I would say that, uh, you know, I, you go to the beach looking for a tan. I was just, uh, I just, I got my opportunity. So I'm, I'm maybe wanting to get another nice tan. Maybe I'm going to stick on the beach. So, you know, you, you, that's all I have to say about that subject. Fair enough. Luke, inland or beach? Uh, either one. I just want one with current, good current flow and structure. Um, that's going to, whether it's on the beach or in the indoor in the inlet itself, that's, that's you're not going to have the most fish. Um, so some of each. Cool. Well, it looks like I'm the hanging chat. I'll say some of each as well. Uh, fish both. There's, uh, there's certainly some pros and cons to both. I, I kind of do like, I'm, I'm kind of with Andy because, you know, the, the people who are saying beach real quick don't have kids when you have kids that i mean the peers can be tough and you got and you have some people who aren't that experienced and who aren't even looking behind them and are whipping all kinds of stuff including treble hooks and stuff and you know and kids of course don't pay attention to hardly anything especially like my four-year-old son and i'm i'm trying to go where there's fewer people not lots of people uh so there's certainly pros and cons of that but for the summertime in the beach I mean, there, it's just, there's so many opportunities to catch all kinds of different types of fish. So it's tough to ignore that. Uh, this has been good. Anyone else have anything to, to add to it before we close down? I have one thing yep. the the, the pier that I've had the most success, um, again, are is inland. Um, but particularly because um, a lot of your docks, your inland marinas, we'll say your marinas, uh, they will have a fishing pier, and um, that that leads to uh, the particularly the ones that there's there's one just down the road here that is in casting distance. The marina is in casting distance, so this pier is on one side of the channel, and the the uh, the marina is on the other side. So anytime that there there's that instance, you've got a great flow, current flow, you've got great depth change, and there's just a lot of additional structure. And so my suggestion is if you if you find a pier that's anywhere near a marina or a, a big dock, that's that's golden. And you got probably cleaning tables. Uh, I've I've seen what happens there. There's one of the biggest nook I've ever seen down and uh, I can't tell you exactly where because I don't want you guys to catch it's more of a pet down there but I mean when you got a cleaning table and I mean and you're near some current it's amazing the size of some of the predator fish will come up there it's cool that's good all right guys well hopefully you found this helpful we're going to be doing a lot more this was more of a of a not a debate but just a talking podcast about peer fishing we're gonna have a whole lot more with with Andy, I know Wyatt's already doing some stuff out there on some some jetties, and we'll do some more piers. I know Justin is uh, he gets goosebumps when we talk about all this stuff, mm-hmm. and uh, and Courtney as well. So you'll see a whole lot more this summer. So please go to saltstrom.com in the fishing tips section. You will see this podcast. That's the best place to leave us comments. They come right to us versus YouTube. They just kind of go out there in the cyberspace. Uh, definitely go to saltstrom.com. Look in the fishing tips section and leave a comment in this blog post it's at the very bottom those come to us and let us know any specific questions or even any specific peers you want us to go uh fish if obviously we can't go to everyone but we'd love to get any and all feedback on that of course if you're an insider member we'll be sharing uh sharing a whole lot more and even showing you some of the exact places that we're fishing all summer long we're adding more coaches on adding a whole lot more fishing reports the community's got some massive massive updates 
uh, and the community now it's its own little progressive app. So it's right there on your phone. It lives and breathes just like any normal app that you would get from the iTunes store, the Google play, if you're into the Androids and uh, really, really cool. Just some awesome stuff. And then of course, are all the tackle, all the tackle discounts and all the cool products. We've got some really cool stuff. Uh, Luke, I saw right before we got on this, you had uh, sent me a message to, to pay for a new mold. So uh, that's all I will say. If you don't know what that means, it means we've got some lures coming. We're actually working on some proprietary molds. Uh, we're really pumped about that. It's All that stuff takes a long time. It's a lot of iterations to get stuff perfect. Uh, but we have some really, really cool stuff coming. Of course, inside our members will get 20% off everything there in the store at fishstrong.com. And if you're not a member yet, what the heck are you waiting for? It's less than a cup of coffee per day. Can you afford 27 cents per day? Oh, you can? You like fishing? Oh, you do? Well, you should come join us. 22,000 people growing every single day with the biggest guarantee probably in the universe. I haven't checked out all the fishing clubs outside of Earth, but definitely here, it is the best one. It has the biggest, boldest guarantee. If you're not catching more fish, having more fun and, and just meet new friends, then you don't pay. It's that simple. And uh, we're having a blast. We're now doing live calls every single Thursday. We're, uh, we're doing some events. We just had an event here recently. Now that COVID is you know, getting a little bit more contained, uh, we're starting to do more live events and uh, I love those. There's nothing like it. That was the first time we met you, Andy, at uh, you know, an event you came to in, uh, in Tampa and uh, just so much fun. So uh, come join us. That's all at saltstrong.com. Come join the club. You'll see very quickly why we have 22,000 plus members and almost everyone seems to be renewing year after year. We at this most recent event, the guy comes up and he's got a the, the original OG Snook Strong shirt, to put it in perspective, mine has been thrown away because it had holes in it. Cause I, I, I mean, this is six years old. I mean, that's an old t-shirt. I mean, this guy's been there since the beginning and is just like thrilled to death and has referred tons of people. So if you are a member, if you, anyone uh, listening that, uh, that has been a member that long, thank you guys so much. You're the foundation of this company or a family and we appreciate you big time. And if you're not, Come join us. We'd love to have you in there. We'd love to be uh, showering you with all kinds of awesome stuff. And we promise we will not pant you. Uh, that's a uh, that's promise from Wyatt. So guys, we appreciate you. We'll talk to you on the next episode. Gents, good job. Peace.